the ubiquitous clicker was missing. Um, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. I was asked to share some of my experiences and observations about open collaboration, and I'm uh, looking forward to do that. But first, let me uh, tell you all that I am excited to be here uh, at an epicenter of free and open source hardware. I'm excited to be here because, as Zarin well demonstrated, you all are at a cutting edge of open collaboration. You know, kind of things have been sorted out, as Aaron pointed out, in free and open source software, free and open source hardware. We're still working things out, and to be here on a day when there are some really important announcements regarding technology on the processor, on I.O., and on memory, but from my perspective, really interesting announcements regarding governance. Governance is really very important to make it all work, to make it a place that's safe to come out and play. But a bit about me. First of all, I was trained as a, in mathematics. I was an engineer a million years ago doing uh, radar and satellite communications engineering. And then about 30 years ago, I went to the dark side and became a lawyer. I began to sprout little red horns at that time, as you would expect. And to the extent that I did anything that had socially redeeming value, probably didn't, I'm a lawyer after all, it was because of that logo in the lower right-hand corner, Red Hat. So for the past 15 years, going on 16 years, I've been the general counsel of Red Hat. And uh, I've had from that perch the chance to observe a lot about the power of open collaboration. So let me offer you just a couple of observations about that. First of all, I've seen Red Hat go from the bad girls and bad boys who are renegades trying to get a seat at the table, trying to be relevant, trying to talk to enterprises, to becoming, in fact, an infrastructure software supplier to the established world, whether that's the New York Stock Exchange, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the White House, et cetera. So in a very short period of time, going from this sort of rebel mindset to actually a, a provider. I've also seen us go from a company that was a mom and pop shop, kind of a local dry cleaner, to a company that was an S&P 500 New York Stock Exchange traded company. So we arrived. We thought we had become a big fish. In fact, we had become a big fish in the, uh, in the ocean in our mind, but of course there are whales in the ocean, big majestic creatures that occasionally swim by you. And uh, recently we encountered a large blue whale who, who asked if we were interested in being part of their enterprise. So that was uh, pretty exciting stuff. More importantly, I have seen incredible value chains created. These are value for customers, value for employees, value for the entirety of the ecosystem. And from my time at Red Hat, uh, I think we were just under $200 million in revenue, just one example of it. And by the time we were acquired by the uh, large blue mammal, um, we were just under $4 billion in revenue. And it turns out that the mammal had, you know, some gold in its belly from cleaning up treasure at the, at the bottom of the ocean and other great places and coughed up a little bit for us as well. So value creation was there, but that's not as important as why was Red Hat rewarded. Obviously, it wasn't rewarded in slide presentation or creation, but we'll, we'll p pass over that for the moment. It was right when we did the rehearsal, so it's one of those gremlins of technology that'll bite you. We were rewarded quite simply because we were able to liberate innovation more quickly. That's it. If you reduce it down to its essence, that was it. And it wasn't innovation that we did. Yes, we are a large contributor to Linux. We are by no means a majority contributor. We're by no means even a dominant contributor. We have a swath of stuff that we do. We help liberate innovation by helping to foster an ecosystem with many other people and then making that consumable to a variety of users. So with that as a background of some of my experiences, let me offer some observations on open collaboration. I'm gonna do this through a series of aphorisms that were uh, generated from my head of government affairs. He's a North Carolinian, who was the uh, youngest elected member of the North Carolina Assembly many, many years ago. And one day, he was talking to me, 
and he was talking in a southern accent, which I'm not going to do very well, and he goes, you know, Mike, when I'm in the halls of Congress and I have to explain what open source is to maybe a senator or a congressman, and the whole time I have is to ride up in an elevator, I have to find a way to do it, and I found it. And, well, yep, yeah, let's see if we can get it to work. And this is his aphorism. He says, Mike, I got to tell you, nobody's as smart as everybody. So if you take the collective wisdom and the collective creativity of a large body of people, it by definition has to be better and more powerful than a single individual. Of course, that whole notion of we're all Einsteins and they're going to come up with E equals MC squared is, uh, you know, there's a couple of Einsteins out there and thank goodness we'll have them. But most of us make incremental improvements and those incremental improvements get assembled by different and other people. So this idea that nobody's as smart as everybody. Another thing that's true is that nobody's as fast as everybody. When you get everybody moving, you got a, uh, a network of people that are co-inventing there, converging, diverging, going together. So if speed of innovation is quickly, nobody's as good as everybody doing it together. This is a really important one. Gee, I never saw it that way. He only came up with the first one, but I'll continue with the southern accent because it's sort of my attempt at one and probably offend some southerners in the audience, but that's not my intent. Um, this really goes to the diversity of the innovation pool. We absolutely want gender diversity and national uh, diversity and, you know, all sorts of other components, but we want diversity of roles, of plays and things that people do in the community, and in particular, the user community. You know, uh, there's a corollary to this I call the Satchmo corollary, which is nobody knows the trouble I've seen. So, if I'm a producer of technology, I will not know intimately the problem that the user is experiencing as well as the user. I may not know about other problems that the user is experiencing, which I haven't identified, and I sure as heck won't know whether the solution is elegant and beautiful for solving their problem coming from their perspective. So the inclusion of users in the innovation community is huge. Red Hat never produced the Apple Newton. We never could have produced the Apple Newton. Perhaps an innovative product, but well before its time because no user was asking for it. When you get into open collaboration and have your users, you have relevance. The users help make sure everything you're doing is relevant. It's very, very powerful. Um, it's cost effective, you know. If you don't have everybody on your P&L, you're going to produce something. So somebody else's somebody is cheaper than your somebody. Another great effect from open collaboration. Uh, this is obviously didn't come from my southern, this came from Eric Raymond, which is a uh, paraphrase of many eyes make all bugs shallow. At a time of specter and heart bleed and the considerations of all of society about information security, the opportunity to collaborate in an open way about security is extraordinarily powerful. Extraordinarily powerful. Nobody trusts a closed environment where you can't look in. Where you can look in, you can help identify the problems, and as importantly, you can help remedy the security problems very, very quickly. As some of you are aware, some of the Heartbleed and Spectre problems were actually compensated for in software after they were discovered. Uh, last thing, perhaps the most important is, I like playing here, because it's fun and safe. So you need an ecosystem that makes people want to come out and play. The minimum is that it seems fair, we have good governance, and that there aren't any trap doors, like an IP that if I use my effort and energy to participate is going to come and hang me or leave me in some position of harm with the organization. That's the base minimum. When you're really successful and you create an environment then that is fun to come and play, because cool people are coming to play and do exciting things, you unleash a whole other wave. That's engagement and passion. Uh, this is just a, a brief story of engagement and passion. Uh, at, at Red Hat, I have, you know, a large, a significant number of the most experienced open source lawyers in the world. One of them, responsible for writing large portions of the GPL v3, uh, came to me and said he wanted to go to a conference. The conference was in Europe. I said, you know, X. We have to rotate this around and we're going to let Y go. And he said, he said, Mike, you don't understand. 
Open source is my life, and I'm going irrespective of whether you pay for me. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'll pay for you. <laughs> Please go. But that passion, that really connecting into things that people care about, that they want to participate in, really opens up incredible stuff. And so when you take all that stuff, you could have a uh, open office pie chart on the left, which somebody's going to get a bigger slice, and it's good, and the person who's got the green slice is happier. But when you add the open collaboration force multipliers, which I just went through, which are creativity and wisdom, speed, much greater relevance in all likelihood if you have a diverse community, cost, security improvements, and passion and engagement, the uh, open office pie chart pie becomes, in fact, a cherry pie, and everyone's pieces are much bigger and much more exciting. Let me leave you with just one final thought. Innovation is something you should leave and feel really good about. Innovation is one of the few things in the world that takes 1 plus 1 and makes it 2.7. Innovation is therefore among the most likely things to lift the lot of humanity all over the world. Can be misused for sure, but it is more likely to do that. And if you are liberating more innovation in the world, chances are you're going to be lifting the lot of humanity while doing your job, while doing interesting technology, while creating a new movement in free and open source hardware. Thanks so much.